Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, so there's some specifics that uh, you can do to make to help you get to that end of year two goal. One is, are all of your board members legacy donors? You may have added some new board members, so there's probably an educational process to get them on board, but uh, that's one easy area to look at, relatively easy area to look at. And I'm gonna invite you, if you're not me, to please mute your phone so I don't hear any of the background noise. Not even cut, you might just be like, we're all muted, muted for you. Okay, uh, the second thing is, do your donors know about your legacy effort? So who has done a marketing, uh, who has included legacy in their marketing efforts in the last month? Okay, so if you have not, and I see there are some that have not, think about what's a marketing effort that you can do to be sure that legacy is included and it gets out there. You might think everybody knows about it, but they don't, for sure they don't. So marketing, we encourage you to drip, 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 to keep putting the message out there um, and to, to change it up so that it is not the same every month, but it changes month to month. And the third thing is to send a meaningful personal email. You might have a select group, a target group. You might say, I wanna send this to all the people that I see every week in the synagogue at, at uh, services or um, some group that you might reach out to them. And by personal, we mean someone who's meaningful to them. So it might be the rabbi of a synagogue. It might be the executive or the president of a, one of your organizations. Um, and when you send that personal plea to, hey, we're still doing this and we're trying to reach the goal of 18 or 36, um, we just have a few more to go. We'd love to talk to you about this. Uh, please let us know if you're interested or even then just say, we'll have somebody follow up in another week or two to hopefully have a meeting with you. And the last element is just ask, you really, if you're not having conversations, you won't get to your goal. So be sure that, look, look back at that prospect list and be sure that you are, um, that you are having conversations. So in our agenda today, we'll be talking about um, changing our thinking a little bit. What does it mean to be donor-centered and how to communicate in a donor-centered way? So I wanna invite you in the chat to enter Things, when, you, when I say the words donor-centered, what do you think about? What comes to mind? And I'm looking, so enter it in the chat. What comes to mind when you hear the words donor-centered? Find out what is important to the donor, great. Asking about why the donor has supported the institution. Great, great question to get into that legacy conversation. Personalized to your donor. Um, so your marketing messages would be personalized to the donor. Um, your stewardship would be personalized so that you're not sending a gift to somebody who doesn't want to receive a gift, right? We had that problem come up before. Involving the donor, getting to know the donor's interests, excellent. So I think about this, when you wanna make a difference or have an impact with your gift, do you give to a charity or to an organization? Or do you give through a charity or an organization? So if I wanna solve the problem of hunger and I send my check to the Food Bank of the Rockies, it's not because I love Food Bank of the Rockies. I might not even like them or I might not know anything about them, but I want to solve the problem of hunger. So they are my vehicle. That's the way I'm going to be able to make a difference. And that's what our donors are doing. They want to make a difference in the world through our organizations. The number one reason that organizations lose donors is because the donor feels like it's a transaction. Um, maybe if they only got from you a form letter after they submitted their um, 
donation online. So they didn't talk to a human being and they got a form letter back. They know the computer received the money, but they don't know anything else about it. Did a human being see it? Do they even know that you made that gift and did it get to where that person intended it to go? So um, that's taking our relationships with donors beyond a transaction and making them more meaningful. So we're reframing. In legacy, we, we're not even asking them for money, certainly not money now. What we are asking them to do is to help us fulfill our mission, to help us provide greatly needed services, to help others in the community. Specifically in our Jewish world, we are asking them to make available a space for Jewish education to take place, for worship to take place, for Jewish traditions to be transmitted from generation to generation. We are asking them to offer a forum where Jewish identities can be shaped. We are asking them to ensure that a community exists for those of us who want to be part of one, and certainly for the generations to come to be part of one. So that's the reframe that we're talking about when we think about being donor-centered. And donor-centered means that your organization works in partnership with your donors to fulfill the mission. So they are at the center or informing everything that you do. When donors were asked what they want in a relationship with an organization they value, they responded the following things. They wanna be thanked for their commitment. They wanna be informed as to the impact that they, their donation made. They wanna be responded to quickly and treated politely, right? Not rocket science. We can all assume that this is what we want and think about when you've made your own donations. We are seeing this number two, the informed us to the impact donations made, especially with our millennial um, donors, that they don't give year over year over year just because you're there. They want to know what difference they're making. So that's something that we have to get better at communicating. To be donor centric means that we're engaging with a donor because making a gift will be meaningful to them. We acknowledge and recognize them for their generosity. We continue to deepen or strengthen our relationship with them. And most importantly, or very importantly, we use receive gifts to accomplish what the donor intended. One of the worst things you can do for a donor is take money that they want, that they wanted to be used in one particular way and use it in another way that they didn't know about, they didn't want, they didn't intend. It is always possible to go back to the donor, not always, but if it is possible to go back to the donor and say, you know, I know you wanted to do this, would you be willing to consider why? So, um, Alan, I'm, I see that you raised your hand and I'm hoping you might have an example to share with us about this situation. No, uh, uh, maybe later, but my okay. question relates to, yeah. supposing I'm 50 years old, and I make a donation to improve the Hebrew school, the religious school. But you're not going to get my money for 30 or 40 years, hopefully. Yes. So how do you deal with, you know, the impact of your gift if that money isn't coming in for 30 or 40 years? Right. Uh, so we can certainly apply everything that I'm talking about today to annual giving. So everything you can apply to people that are giving donations today. In terms of legacy, um, we want to share with them the impact. We know that the donor has expressed interest in the Hebrew school because they've directed their legacy gift towards the Hebrew school. So education is important to them. So how can I, as a, as a person on the legacy team or as a member of the organization, um, make a connection with this donor showing the impact that our educational program has today. And that will only grow and deepen and expand in the future, certainly because of the resources that will be received through a person's legacy gift. Mm -hmm. okay. That's how I would answer that. Okay. So I mean, 
Yeah, go ahead, Alan. It's also a way for them to continually give for the religious school and maybe give earlier. Yes. Um, yes. Not wait until they're dead. Right, because um, you're connecting them. So when it's amazing when a donor has indicated what they're interested in, because then you can re really tailor the stewardship to, um, to, to what that donor is interested in. So if you're having, let's say you're having a um, graduation or a CDOR party for the first graders where they're getting their first CDOR, you might invite this legacy donor and say, um, you know, how great it would be to be able to welcome you to our CDOR party where the first graders get their first ever CDOR so you can see in their eyes um, what this means to them. And that's what you'll, that's what you support through your generous annual giving. And that's what you will be supporting through your legacy gift. Okay. Also, if you have, as you have opportunities, right, needs and opportunities that come up, that donor has already expressed an interest in the educational program. So let's say there's a new opportunity to do um, some Shabbaton or some immersive educational program that's going to take a little bit of money. Maybe that's a donor that you go to because they've identified as being interested in this area. So it's a great opportunity for really good stewardship. Okay. Um, th this is the Legacy Donor Bill of Rights. Bet you, bet you didn't know there was such a thing. There is a Donor Bill of Rights. Um, we took it and we amended it to make sure that it spoke to legacy donors. And I'll send this as a handout after our time together. Um, but I wanted you just to know that it exists and um, it's a helpful document to as you're reorienting and trying to put the donor at the center and, and work with donors as partners, what does it mean that the donor has sort of rights, if you will? So one of the things is honoring donor intent. That's their right as a donor, is that you will honor their intent. Um, transparency, so if they, if they are asking for specific information that as much as you can, that you share that acknowledgement of their gift. They want to see the impact of their gift and they want to be professionally communicated with. So that's what some of the things are on it. Now, when I think about donor communication, so these are people that have made legacy commitments and are now your donors and you're communicating with them. So I like to think of it as bringing joy into the homes of your donors. That's what you want to do because a lot of the a lot of the communications that they're getting from you are going to be through their mailbox or, or on their phone or uh, on their iPad as they're lying in bed at night. So um, think about what you're doing that's bringing joy into their lives, the joy of learning that they're a wonderful person, the joy of con contributing to society, of knowing that they are problem solvers, that they are part of something really special, that they see their values affirmed and acted on, that they're part of making the world a better place, that they're feeling like they're making a difference in other people's lives. So when you communicate, when you do that impact report or annual report, think about these elements. Am I sharing with my donors the idea that they helped make this happen? They helped make this possible. And without them, we wouldn't be able to do it. So I'm going to ask you to enter in the chat, or if there's something that you'd like to share with the group, how have you brought joy to your donors in the last six months? I'm going to stop sharing for a minute because I want to see if anybody has anything to share with us. You finished year one. Is there, did you do anything special for your donors? I'm not seeing anything. David, did you have something to share? Ellen says she's provided personalized tours of the JFS building and focus on the program that interested, interests them the most. Excellent. Ellen, I want to ask you, did you know when they, when they came to do the tour, uh, did you know what their interests were or did you find that out 
as you were giving the tour? It varied. I mean, some with some people, we did know exactly what their what their um, most fervent interest was, whether the older adult services or refugee resettlement. And with other people that we didn't know well, we got to learn about their interests as we um, chatted with them in their visit. Great. So it was really a nice deepening of the relationship and what you know about them, what they know about you. Yes. Beautiful. Yes. Um, Jen, Jen said, I hope that the stewardship piece we just sent highlighting the students' work at the academic fair brought joy. Um, Jen, did you have the opportunity to connect the impact with the donor in that piece? I'm sorry, someone was talking. Can you say that again? Yeah, did you have the opportunity in that stewardship piece to connect the impact of the students' work to the donor? We did. We, I mean, when we listed the donors at the on, on one of the pages in a full on a full page, and uh, the introduction to their the list was, you know, you're essentially what made this. I can't remember what the words were, but basically, uh, it's because of your um, commitment uh, that this was possible. Something like that. Love it. I love the because of you or because of your, I love that language. I think that's really powerful for a donor. Um, so Bernie and Barb said they sent very special personalized birthday cards. And um, Barb or Bernie, what was the response to your beautiful cards? Bernie, Bernie got the, um, his birthday was in March, so he got two absolutely amazing birthday cards from members of the, of our uh, Life and Legacy team. And I mean, it was really nice. It was, it was really very special. I got some nice ones too, but mine was yeah. a lot farther Everybody, ago. everybody gets them. And all, we, all the, uh, yes, we make sure that everybody who has a birthday. All the Legacy uh, uh, LOI uh, people. Right, they Beautiful. all get a very special birthday card. Beautiful, nice. And Jason, your Purim baskets, how did that go over with your legacy donors? Um, I don't know. I, Jen, have you heard back from any of the legacy donors regarding it? Not specifically. Yeah. Well, I love, I love, uh, yeah, some people don't like gifts. I like gifts, so... Uh, I love when the day school sends the pouring baskets. It always makes me feel reconnected. But did you send them, to... Jen? Did you send them free, or did they have to buy them? The donors. Did, uh, we we the the school sent a bag to every legacy donor, right. which in some cases just means that like the don't the the school was among a number of other donors that sent to that particular family, and mm -hmm. the school was added as a name. It also said to the donor. Good. Nice. Okay, moving on. Um, in the area of donor communication, a, a way to, is to be focused on the organization or organization centric. Our endowment campaign is underway and we need your support. The other way, the donor centered way is your legacy gift will ensure we continue to care for isolated elderly for generations to come, right? That's it's just changing the language around to put it from the frame, in the frame of the donor and how they are looking at it. Um, so when you break this down, what's something that's helpful is to focus on that word you. This is from Tom Ahern who writes about news, newsletters that work. You matter to reframe the accomplishments of the organization as the donor's accomplishments. And it can work both for now gifts and for legacy as you share the impact and you say, thanks to your gift, the impact will only continue to grow. You have invested wisely. So show your donors again and again that the organization is worthy of their investment. And we still need you. So when you have new needs, new opportunities, and new goals, share them. Even when telling an amazing success story, leave your donors craving 
another interaction. Like imagine what we could do. We did this amazing thing. Imagine what we could do if we had this. So here's an illustration of an annual report. We like to call them impact reports sometimes. Um, it's from a few years ago, but I like what they did. The East, Fam East Jewish Family and Children's Community Services of East Bay, California. 65 staff members plus 17 board members plus 505 volunteers plus 1,500 donors plus you equals one goal. Serving and standing up for 6,000 vulnerable people in our East Bay community. So I thought that was a really nice way of using numbers to make them very personal and very real. Here's another example. This one came from Seattle and they did it as one community um, after their, they had been running the legacy program for a few years. They wanted to tell everybody how they were doing. So they said, since right, what will your legacy be since 2016? 329 community members have committed an estimated 10.6 million to endowments that will generate this much per year that local organizations can use towards programs, education, scholarships, operations, and more, and then all the organizations below. And I wanted to take the opportunity to share this story because I don't know that I've shared it with you yet, which is think of all your assets as a stack of 10 dimes, meaning 100% of your assets is in a stack of 10 dimes. And I'm gonna take one dime off the top and that's my Sadaka dime um, or my tithe dime. Um, it's the money that you know, I'm going to give 90% to my kids and to the people that I love, but that 10% is my contribution to the organizations that I have cared for during my life. And they're going to get that portion. So I like the way they use that um, kind of idea that you can just take a portion. It doesn't have to be your whole entire estate that you can leave us. But even taking 10% or 8% and, and designating that charitably could be just huge. And it's our job to help the donors realize the difference that they can make. The messaging for today, and this is how you can kind of frame it, we are here for you today, right? We're doing this for you today. We did this for you today. Your legacy gift ensures that we're here for your children tomorrow or your grandchildren or the next generation, however you wanna say it, but it's your legacy gift ensures that we're here for them tomorrow. And I think it's a very hopeful message reminding people that you're not planning on closing your doors. Just because there's a little pandemic outside doesn't mean that you're gonna stop doing what you do best. We know more than ever that people need to come together, that people need people. And our synagogues, our organizations, that's the business that we've been in all these years. So we are not closing up shop. Um, and by integrating that message that we're here tomorrow, and that, that makes sense to a donor. When you're asked for an annual gift and when you're asked for a tomorrow gift or an endowment gift, a legacy gift, it makes sense that you are planning for today and for tomorrow. So here's an example. Here's a, a poster. And I want you to think when you're looking at this, just take a look at it now and say, is this organization centric or is this donor centric? And put it in the chat, what you think. And I didn't make it particularly easy. So there's no, you know, if you don't know obvious what the obvious answer is, don't worry, you're not the only one. Strikes me is people-centered. And Ellen, if you'd be willing to unmute and tell us what it, it is that makes well, you think that. The first thing I see is a mother and child. I'm yes. assuming that they are um, um, clients of the agency. Uh -huh. who needed help, as the tagline says. We needed help, Catholic Charities was there. So I'm seeing right away that these are the people. The, you know what you were saying before, am I supporting the organization or I'm supporting the people who benefit? When I see this, I think of the people who are benefiting from the organization. So Beautiful, yeah. thank you. So I wanna point out that it was the image that Ellen, that drew Ellen in to say, this is 
donor centered. Now, Jason, you said organization centered. So share with me what made you say that. Well, it's definitely focused on what the charity does, but the focus is, you know, this is the great stuff we're doing at this charity. Please support us. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, what you were saying before about, you know, when you as a donor give money, this is what it goes to. Yes. It's not quite as direct. Right. Okay. So the charity name is the biggest typeface, right? That's, that's one of your sort of first cues. It's about the charity. Um, you could say you were there that would be donor centered. Because of supporters like you, Catholic Charities helped us. So in the description here, hi, I'm Dever, this is my mom. Last year we packed up our home, right? This is the story. We thought we were gonna be homeless, but Catholic Charities helped us catch up on the rent. But you helped us catch up on the rent, right? You, the donors, through Catholic Charities, helped us catch up on the rent. Uh, usually these quotes are not direct quotes. Usually it's someone who is helping the person quote something. So you're very often in a position where you can make that kind of change. Um, your, here, designate Catholic charities for your workplace giving. Good. Your workplace giving can help children or can help more children like Dever and his mom. Okay, here's another one. Put it in the chat. What do you think? Organization centered or donor centered? <laughs> Jen, fear centered. Go ahead. Would you like to say anything about that? I mean, it just, you know, it, it just makes me feel like afraid I, you don't want donors to give out of fear uh -huh. um, I you know I, I just think it's a it, I don't think it's a good way to inspire those to give great I hadn't thought of that before but thank you for bringing up that point what else it's just a terrible poster <laughs> do you remember seeing it it was it's a pretty old one but I remember it all right, you're, you're all saying it's terrible. However, it is about you, right? Guard those you love. And your gift's gonna have a huge impact. Give to conquer cancer. That's what my gift's gonna do. And the organization's name is mentioned at the bottom, but not attributed, right? Not American Cancer Society is going to guard those you love. It's just named at the bottom. So it has some of the elements, whether you like it or not, it does have some of the elements that we like to see in donor-oriented communication. So in communication, you have the opportunity to tell stories. It, two different kinds of stories. One is impact stories. And impact stories tell the story of a person who has benefited from your organization's programs or services. It defines a problem and shows how the donor is helping to solve that problem. The other kind of story is a donor story or a testimonial, which shares the donor's emotional connection to the organization, why they have chosen to leave a legacy, and sometimes even specifying the vehicle that they've chosen to use. So both stories are good. There's a place for both stories to be used. Um, and I just wanted to call your attention to the, the sort of they're constructed a little differently and they are they are used for different purposes. So an impact story, I love this picture. Why do I love it so much? Not only do I see the child reading from the Torah, learning outside in the fresh air, but I also see this beautiful young woman with a yod in her hand leaning over it. So to me, it shows not just we're working with kids, we're doing this amazing educational program, but also we're working with young adults and they're the teachers for our kids, they're role models. So it says a lot to me in that image. An impact story is about a person, it's emotional, it, it demonstrates that 
whoever funded this is making a really good investment because the support is positively impacting lives. And it hopefully gives the donor some ownership of what's being accomplished. So it's that because of you message that we were able to do this. That's a beautiful impact story. Here's an example. Judy now actively participates in Zoom gatherings with her family and friends thanks to your support of JFS's Senior Tech Lifeline. Your legacy gift today assures JFS will be helping older adults live healthy, independent, and connected lives tomorrow. So you can use it thanking people today. That's an impact story, but you're tying it to the impact that you that their legacy gift is going to make in the future. We can make our readers proud to be the hero of the story because people share what they're proud of. So here's a testimonial that I love from Temple Emanuel in Sarasota. Um, they went into detail about their gift. So they said, our gift will provide $15,000 every year forever. At our death, we have provided for a legacy or endowment of 20 times our annual gift. We call it 20 to one. Our gifts to Temple are about $15,000 annuals. They had, to, they had to tell people to disclose that this is what they gave every year. So to assure that we continue, we have planned an endowment of 300,000 at the second to die, very specific. With a 5% annual yield, our legacy will provide $15,000 to the temple every year. If you are a Cornerstone member, consider providing your annual gift to temple forever. This is how we look at endowing our gifts with a legacy plan. And then it has this nice thing highlighted in blue, a forever gift, which keeps the music, teaching, and community alive forever. So they've gone back to their mission in that statement at the end, and they've put out an idea. So I can see that you're all like being very thoughtful about this. Like this is really interesting. A lot of information is being shared here. Most of our donors aren't interested in sharing this much information, but it can be very powerful when they do. Here's a way that you can send a message that's donor-centered communication. So here's a photo showing what your gift has accomplished. Thank you. And again, as Alan pointed out, this is very often, this might be for a now gift or an impact story. Here's a short video showing how your legacy gift will impact children's lives every day. Please share it. Anytime we can have other people help us do marketing for us, it's a good thing. Here's a virtual tour of our first day of school. Look at the difference you are making. Here's a story about how your gift helps. Please enjoy. And then with that absolutely gorgeous photo that says so much in just, with just a beautiful image. Video, whether we like it or not, is the number one communication tool in the world today. So I'm gonna show you a quick 30 second video of, uh, it's not a Jewish one, it's Catholic Relief Services, but I thought they did such a great job of a donor-centered video. So we know how to do the marketing videos and the introduction to life and legacy, and here's what's great about our organization. What does a donor-centered video look like? Hi, my name is Nikki Gamer with Catholic Relief Services, and I'm reporting to you from a school in the suburbs of Amman, Jordan. And these kids around me today, they are learning, and that is thanks to your support. So they actually have a little message for you. That's pretty easy, right? Get your kids together. This, this was not professionally done. It wasn't didn't look professionally produced, but easy and, and very focused on the donor. Um, here's another one. And this one, this one is from Camp Northland, B'nai B'rith in, uh, outside of Toronto.
Thank you so much for supporting Camp Northland. Thank you for making sure that Camp Northland is going to be sustainable and thrive well into the future. And it's because of all of you that we are confident that Camp Northland is going to be here as a landmark and really a central focus point of the Jewish community within the greater Toronto area and beyond. For our future, for our children, thank you. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment because I've just shown you two really cool videos. Um, thoughts, how do you connect it to being donor-centered? What are you learning from these videos? Not a hell of a lot. <laughs> um, because all of this stuff you've been showing us is to get the door open, is to be able to meet with them. And I think we spend too much time sometimes worried about the marketing materials than the relationship, which is the key, is finding out what their interests are and that I've, I've read some obituaries. I hate to say this way, but I've read some obituaries lately and I was amazed what I learned about people that didn't know what they did and what was important to them. And I think it's spending the time on the research on who you're going after, having the right people make the ask for the right thing. And that takes preparation. All of these things will help you open the door, but it's when you get inside the door and you have the conversation and you listen to what their interests are and then try to match them. I think that's the key. You know, little, you know, people used to drive me crazy about, you know, what's the long range plan or what's the strategic plan. Nobody ever reads that stuff. Um, it, you know, this is to get you in the door. And so actually, Alan, these aren't to get you in the door. The purpose of these videos is to send them to legacy donors. Yeah, that right. Already nice, made, thank you. Yeah. Have already They're made commitments. Nice. And it's just simply a way to say thank you. Uh, it's another way to say thank you. It's another way to connect them to the organization because they're not in our, in our buildings necessarily every day seeing what's going on. Certainly at camps, they're not, at least last year, even though there was camp, nobody was allowed in. So we couldn't even bring donors to camp to continue and deepen those relationships. So this is yet another tool. That's all it is, is a tool that we have to keep the connection and hopefully deepen the engagement with our legacy donors. It'd be more important, I think, to have somebody from the life and legacy or somebody from the organization meet with that person every two, three years to talk about their gift, what they did, and how you're working in the area that was of interest to them. The yes. videos are all nice, um, but a conversation um, is much more important. You're absolutely right. And we just want to give you lots of different tools so that um, lots of different people can be involved in this. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it isn't just one way. It right. is and true that their true. connection, Al, I'm going to move on, but okay. keep the thought. I, um, and I, we get, can the, I get the point. Okay. Um, an impact report. Many times an organization will issue an impact report to let people know how they're doing. So this was a beautiful report from Sarasota. Um, I love the imagery. They used it as an opportunity to highlight legacy donors. So they listed them. Um, this was the Federation legacy donors. They explained the program. And then they even went on with that you language. You are nurturing. What am I nurturing? Jewish life, education, and values. You are building. What am I building? A strong community. And you are strengthening our relationships with Israel. So really nice language. Um, and then on the 
on the other side of the page, they were able to share more details and testimonials, little stories about the people that were involved in these um, programs and the impact it had on them. So really nice. If you're thinking of doing an annual report, use this information about where is the donor in this and that you language to try to make it come alive, really what, what they're able, what you are able to accomplish through their gifts. So that's the thing to keep in mind in your communication is asking, where is the donor in this? By being donor-centered, we turn our donors from passive, i.e. the guy with the remote control, who are all of us at one point, to active participants, people who regard their support as an essential component of their household and personal budgets, as well as part of their legacy. So think about, maybe put in the chat, or you can share it, one thing that your organization can do immediately to be more donor-centered. And while you think about that and enter them in the chat, I hope, I'm gonna give you some future stuff. Next week, our, our um, conference starts, our leadership gathering. I hope that you'll all be able to take advantage of it. Um, it starts next Sunday night with an opening keynote and we'll have keynotes and workshops and focus groups throughout the uh, day and a half. So we'll hope you'll take part in that. And our next training together will be August 31st on steward stories, stewardship and formalization. And that will kick off our year three, if you can believe it or not. I hope very much to be in person and um, assuming that I will be in person Osnat will be reaching out to you to schedule some meetings so that I can visit with you and get to know you a little better um, as we haven't even had the opportunity to meet in person yet. In addition, we are offering national trainings. So if you have new team members and they wanna get up to speed on having a legacy conversation, on a little more information about legacy giving or on stewarding donors, We'll be offering them every, every couple months or so, and Osnat will give you more information as that comes out. We're also offering periodic webinars with guest presenters, and we hope you'll be able to take advantage of those. Um, Robin, I see you raised your hand. I did. So I would like to know what data you're collecting and measuring on the impact of all these communications. Like is someone, can, uh, someone collecting data on the open rate. I am married to a statistician and I am very cynical when it comes to a lot of this because I wanna know what we're measuring. You know, a lot of it sounds good and I'm not saying it's not good. I've worked in development for, you know, my whole professional career, yeah. but are we, what do we know that's working? So unfortunately we don't collect that data because we're not the ones putting out these messages, um, you are. So I encourage you, if you have those capabilities, and now increasingly more of us do because Google and Facebook make it a little easier for us to measure some impact, um, and your websites also track, figure out or get somebody on your team who can help you track the communications that you're putting out. Um, now, that being said, I did want to share with you that we are trying something in one of our communities. It's Montreal currently. It's a Facebook campaign an ad campaign, and we are measuring click-throughs and um, if they fill out the information card and if any of those turn into LOIs. And we don't have high expectations, but with social media, they're saying, give it 90 days and measure it and see if you're seeing a difference. We also have two different ads that we're trying. So we're gonna see if one ad is getting more of a response than another ad. Um, I would love to say that we had information. All, all we can do is really gather it from what we learn from other people who are, who are measuring this uh, and from all of you as you measure it to let us know what's working. Some of the things will work. I, you know, I just, I'm thinking about what Alan said before. It, it will work as a marketing tool, but it might not 
get you, it's not going to get you a legacy, a, a letter of intent. Like this, this program was not on marketing. It's, it's really on how we communicate as an organization with our donors. Um, and that's beneficial not only for our legacy donors, but also for our regular donors. Helping cement that partnership that we have with them at every opportunity can only benefit us. It'll make them more willing to give the next time we ask because we'll get a little more credibility because we'll say, you know what? We didn't expect it, but the, the furnace burned out and it's going to cost us $46,000 to replace it. So if you can help out, please do. I just heard that story yesterday. If I didn't know as, as a member, I wouldn't know that that happened. You would just figure out how to cover it. But why not tell me and let me be part of the solution if I want to be? So it's kind of opening some communication with our donors where like we think we always have to be happy and everything has to be good and everything has to be great to communicate with them, but it doesn't. They, we are living, breathing organisms and we go through ups and downs. So communication is appreciated, I think. So Robin, get your husband on board and um, then let us know what you find, what you learn. I can tell you something that we did recently that was very successful. So we have yes. sustaining members who pay $1,000 over their dues commitment. And Judy, who's in France, Judy Lax and I, um, called all of them to ask them if they'd be willing to be on a list in our annual report. Yes. So first thing I will tell you is that nobody answers the phone unless they know the number. So, you know, Judy got a couple of people. We basically left voicemails and people either responded by text or with email. Yep. But all of them agreed to be on the list. Wow. And it was just a simple way to reach out and say, you know, we thank you for being a sustaining member. We'd like you to be on a list. And some of them are life and legacy, some are not, which means we're now going to follow up in due course with yes. the people who are not life and legacy, but are sustaining members to talk about life and legacy. Beautiful. What a great... Um... Great example. Thank you. Another thing is, as you're working with these lists, you can figure out a designation, like take our little logo and make it miniature and superscript. And when you do lists and insert that logo for people that are also legacy donors so that you get kind of double marketing out of it. Yeah, we're listing all our legacy donors in our annual report and we have 58. Nice. So I think people will be impressed when they see the list. Yeah. Beautiful. All right, someone, uh, Bruce said, improve communications. Bruce, can you be more specific? Are you still there, Bruce? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm muting me. Okay, um, okay. We're just, we're just, we're a small team. Yeah. Pretty much I'm the only lay leader involved and we're just overwhelmed. We just don't have time. I mean, I have yeah. a list of people I'm working through trying to reach out to them and try to get them involved. And we've we've reached into our, our, our leadership base and we're not getting much response in terms of even being part of the ask. So we're overwhelmed and we're doing our best. Yeah, so first of all, thank you for being a lay leader and uh, showing up tonight and being willing to take this on. That's just huge. Um, no, no one person can do it by themselves. Uh, Bethel, as great as they are, will tell you that it's because of that team, right? That uh, Robin, shake your head if I'm right. It's and, your and team another, working together. Right. And, and, other, and we've talked with Robin. I've talked with Alan. Okay, and good. We've talked with the people. I'm still not getting the, the support within our own community. We're getting other people helping us out. But it's been a, it's been a challenging year. Yes. With everything else that's going on. Yes. And, and all these other decisions we're making on a daily basis. So it's right. just been challenging. Yeah, this has been a particularly challenging time these last two years now. Um, this last month. I'll be beginning to talk more about integration. I think you're hearing a little bit from me already, but we get more into it in the third year, especially the fourth year, um, because ultimately in the long term, um, we want you to have mechanisms in place where legacy is just a natural part of the ongoing fundraising that the organization naturally does year over year. 
So it won't require necessarily its own, it won't be off on its own. We don't want you to silo legacy. We wanna make it easy. It's why we try to help you by creating stewardship pieces like uh, how many of you have got the opportunity to use this Legacy Matters to, to send it out to any of your donors. Great. And if you can share how you did it, what'd you do with it? So, so I actually, um, the Fed, or we sent it to all the donors on the behalf Beautiful. of the organizations. Nice, thank you, Osnat. Did anybody mm -hmm. re receive it? <laughs> I received it, but I also requested an extra from Os, who very willingly provided it because I have a donor who's out of town and also it's not so um, electronically inclined and really wanted me to send everything in paper. And so I was able to send that along as well. Great. Great. Barb, you have to unmute. Yeah, I, I, we, we had that out at our of our community Seder um, as one of many things they could look at, pick up and whatever nice. um, on, the, on their way into the, the big room. But we're all, and we're also going to have it at our annual meeting, which is coming up. Um, but I, can I mention something else that, yes. that we what we've done, uh, we've done a pretty good job of reaching the old people, the people I call old people like us <laughs> in the organization. People who are old in age or people who have been there a long time? Um, mostly the old people have been there a long time. So okay, I mean, that's fair. Not exclusively, but mostly. But I, so we need to begin reaching out to the people who are younger and we are feeling like we don't know how to do that. So I have signed up at the big conference coming up for something called Engaging Ge Next Generation donors in your legacy initiative. And I'm really looking forward to that. And there's some other good workshops being Great. offered. So hopefully Great. we'll get some Thank you. And the workshop that's immediately before that one is Patrick Schmidt, who will be talking about um, thinking beyond sort of the normal suspects for legacy donors. So mm -hmm. that might yeah. be helpful as well. And he talks yep. a little bit about millennial giving. Yep. Any other thoughts anybody wants to share? takeaways. Ariella, do you, are you a professional at the JCC? All right, here's my yes, question I, for you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> how are you, how can you support Bruce? Um, well, we're working together in right. trying to build our, our team um, right. is really one of our biggest goals. Um, we actually met last week and put together a list of our top 20 and Bruce took some. I have a few and Dave has a few also. Um, we're, we're slowly, slowly trying. Great. And trying to figure out our time and from a staff perspective, what's um, allotted for this project, for that project and all of the above. Right. Okay. Don't hesitate if you want another another perspective or another voice, another creative brain to reach out to Osnat or even me if you need. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's that's what we're here for. Not tonight because Osnat's busy, but <laughs> a lot of things. All right. Um, I want to just thank you so much for being here. Osnat, do you have anything to add tonight? Um, no, I mean, I thank you everyone to, for coming. I know it's like a summer night out here. So thanks for taking the time to sit on the computer and um, thank you, Tammy. Much appreciated. All right, take care, be well, and good luck. Thank you. I thank hope you. to see you at the conference. Thank you.